is it fair to say then that lockdowns were just a mistake? Yes. I don't think lockdowns in, in, a, un, uh, in a society that's as unequal as ours could possibly succeed. What is, have, have actually been the effects of these lockdowns? 100 million cancer screenings have been skipped. And that's going to lead to a million people with later stage cancer that should have been picked up. The, the psychological effects in the US, something like one in four young adults seriously considered suicide in June of 2020. 100 million people is the estimate thrown into poverty worldwide by the economic dislocation caused by the lockdown. 230,000 children had died in South Asia alone. It was bound to destroy the lives of the poor, the working class, the you know, it was just, and, it's, and, ch and children. It's exactly what it did. The, the lockdown was focused protection of the laptop class instead right. of focused protection of the of the of the vulnerable old, and that's why hospital systems were under stress because we protected the wrong people. For vaccine mandates, if you are mandating the vaccine, you have failed as a public health agency. Because what, what, the, it, that, what that means is there's a substantial number of people who don't trust you. The, for young men, the, the mRNA vaccines cause myocarditis at unacceptable rates. One in 2,000, one in 3,000, something like that. That is too high. Are you tired of using bulky old wallets, giving you a bulge where you don't want it to be? My old wallet was massive, so it brought all the ladies to the yard, which was a huge distraction and got in the way of my esteemed work on trigonometry. Ridge wallets have an incredible solution for you. This is mine, sleek, stylish, and with an industrial look to it. It can fit 12 cards with cash on the back using a clip like this one or a strap. We've got one for the whole team. I've got one, Francis has one, even our producer Anton has one, but he's from Liverpool, so he flogged his on the black market. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have only one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge are so confident in the quality of their product, they will give you 45 days to test drive their wallets. That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it within 45 days. Because Ridge is such great guys, they're gonna give you 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special code, which is of course, trigger. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today, among his very many titles, is a professor of uh, medicine at Stanford University and uh, one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Welcome to Trigonometry. Just a delight to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a great pleasure to have you on. We've been meaning to have you on for a long time. Uh, however, for those of, uh, of our audience who are not familiar with you and your role, particularly over the last couple of years, uh, tell everybody who are you, how are you, where you are, what has been the journey through life that leads you here? Uh, sure. So I have, a, I have a strange background. I have an MD and a PhD in economics, of all things. Um, I've been a professor in the medical school at Stanford for 20-some years. Uh, I've written on, on infectious disease policy for a long time. Uh, when COVID hit, I sort of came to a different view than many people, I guess, um, that the, the disease was pretty widespread already, uh, that there was a age, a very steep age gradient in risk, in risk factors. And so we should follow a very different policy uh, than we did follow. Uh, the policy, uh, eventually, we labeled it the Great Barrington Declaration. The idea is focus protection of vulnerable people uh, and then letting you know, children go back to life, right? low risk people get back to life because the harms from the lockdowns themselves, maybe we'll talk about this during, the, during our, our podcast, but the harms from the lockdowns themselves are so bad that you don't want, you just want to avoid them. Um, that document, which I wrote with with uh, a couple of people from, uh, with, the, with Sunetra Gupta from Oxford and, and uh, Martin Kuldor from Harvard, that went viral. Uh, it, so anyways, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but that, that, that that's, that's my background. I've, I've done this kind of work for a long time um, and been teaching at Stanford for a long time. And you were one of the people together with Sinectra Gupta and others who were articulating the view during the, the pandemic itself, the, the main section of it, that uh, lockdowns were very harmful, that many of the other public health policies that were being pursued were mistaken. 
Um, and one of the responses was uh, to ignore you and, in fact, to censor many of the things that were being said. So here we are. We can sort of look back uh, and assess how things have gone. As you look back, do, do you think you were right? Do you think you were wrong? What is your assessment of how, how it's played out? I think um, we got a lot right uh, very early. So uh, we meaning, I mean, I was, wasn't just me alone. There was a, me and a, a very large number of, of other infectious disease uh, uh, epidemiologists and, and, uh, and other, other health policy people that, that had shared my view. Um, so for instance, uh, in April of 2020, I ran a study looking at how extensively the disease had already spread in Santa Clara County, California, where I live, in LA County, and then another study with Major League Baseball all around the country. Um, we found in, in LA and in Santa Clara was that there was th three or 4% prevalence of COVID antibodies. Um, th that mean, what that means is if you have the antibody, you can talk, we can argue about immunity, but that certainly means that you've been infected and, and recovered. Um, so that means that, or that means that there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot more spread than people had realized. There's like 50 times more infections than cases. That meant the lockdown in April of 2020 meant the lockdown could not work. Like if you were, if you're thinking, okay, we get the lockdown, we get to zero, that was gone. Of course, that turned out to be true. We didn't, we didn't actually end up uh, getting rid of the disease, unfortunately. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, and there have been like a hundred of these similar studies that have been done since that, that sort of that verify the same result we found. Um, Jay, so sorry to jump in. So is it fair to say then that lockdowns were just a mistake? Yes. Yeah, I think there were. I think that the disease was seeded around the world sometime in probably in fall 2019, late fall 2019. Could be November, could be December, could be. I mean, you could persuade me earlier. I'm not, I don't know the exact date. Um, the, I, the evidence for this is that. Uh, there are antibody studies again from bl stored blood banks in uh, in Europe, in Africa, that find COVID antibodies from stored blood in fall 2019. How did it get there? Unless someone someone from China went there. Um, you know, of course, you had these massive outbreaks in in Italy in February, in Iran in, in February 2020. It was too late. By the time we locked down. This disease spreads so easily, so fast, and it just doesn't take a ton of contact uh, with the air of people someone's breathing uh, with, with it that, that it was not, it was far too late to, if the idea was to get the disease down to zero. Now, if the, if the idea was to get the disease, uh, slow the spread so that we can build hospital capacity and things like that, well, lockdowns failed at that too. We didn't actually build hospital capacity. We, we did all kinds of other things. Um, that that and the there was this like sense of we should keep locking down like you know the, the disease would come and go based on you know the, its physics but we had this illusion of control over the spread of the disease we can talk more about why i think lockdowns failed there's there's a deep social science reason i think why it failed mainly i don't think lockdowns in in a un, uh, in a society that's as unequal as ours could possibly succeed and jay why did we lock down then why did we follow China's lead? I, I, because I'm no great expert on China, but I look at them and I think, yeah, that's not probably the way to do a lot of things, really. What, copy a totalitarian regime, which has got a disastrous approach to human rights? It was really shocking, actually. Uh, so we, um, I'm part of this case where we, we actually got to depose Anthony Fauci. It, in the early days of the pandemic, he sent uh, one of his trusted aides a man named Cliff Lane to China on this, essentially this trip uh, that the World Health Organization organized. They, they came back from the trip completely impressed that China had, had conquered the disease in January 2020. Now, of course, there wasn't a lot of testing going on in January 2020. Um, China, as you say, Francis, has this track record of, of authoritarian power that's just alien to the West. At least it was alien to the West before, before March 2020. Um, <laughs> And so it, it really, it, I think it surprised everybody. I, I saw this uh, this interview of Neil Ferguson, the the uh, the, uh, the epidemiologist at Imperial College London, talking about the Chinese uh, the Chinese model and his how stunned he was that that the West actually adopted. He was he was actually happy about it, but he was he was very surprised. Um, I think it was fear and panic, Francis. That at the end of the day, people looked at the Chinese model and said, "Oh gosh, it, they got rid of it by January 2020." They looked at Italy, uh, which was a total mess. 
Um, they looked at uh, uh, they, they looked at New York City and they were just scared. I think fear led us to, to completely irrational choices, choices that we never would have made had we not made had we not panicked uh, in March of 2020. Jay, why why didn't we look? Uh, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understood by the by the Great Barrington Declaration is you were saying, look, this is a way we've always dealt with pandemics through centuries. This is the most effective way of dealing with it. This is what we should do. Why did we suddenly throw away hundreds of years of, of learning how to deal with a pandemic and try this new approach? I mean, I think uh, I, I have a couple, couple of things. I, I just told you the one about fear and panic. I think that that certainly, certainly was like probably the most important explanation. But Jay, that would have been the case always. Yeah. People would always have been scared in a pandemic. Uh, it's, uh, but I think the problem was like this one looked, this one was, you know, if you look at the actual infection fatality rate, it's it's more than those century pandemics, like maybe 1918. I mean, so, so we're looking at this going, okay, this is the big one. This is the, this, this, we've waited a century for this pandemic. It's finally arrived. Um, but there's some other aspects of this, right? So imagine, I don't know for certain this is true, I, but it may be true that this was a lab leak from a gain of function work, right? So from, from, from a, a program of research Aimed at increasing the the infectivity or or, or, or of a of a of the pathogen. What if you're responsible for that research program, and you fear that it's like out of your lab or out of the out of a lab that you supported, and you're a major figure like Tony Fauci or, or Francis Collins or, or or Jeremy Farrar? I mean, you're going to want to do absolutely everything you possibly can to like put the genie back in the bottle, um, and. You know, they don't really have a lot of social science background. They really don't have a lot of, frankly, they're not even, many of them are just lab scientists, not really epidemiologists. They don't understand the, uh, the, the limitations of these kinds of, or the harms from these kinds of interventions. It's, for them, it's just, okay, it's a, it's a model. You, you, in the model, you, you, you make sure newborns don't interact with their moms and all of a sudden the disease goes away or whatever. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just naive. it's just incredibly naive. So, but they, but they, but they, but their incentive is to like let's do everything we possibly can to, to, to reduce the damage from this thing that I've supported. I, now, again, I don't know for certain it's a lab leak, but imagine the psychology of it. But Jay, do you also think as well? And if we look at our society now, we there's this belief amongst a lot of people that science can conquer anything. It can cure any disease. We've you know we've conquered infectious disease. We're deeply, a lot of Western civilization is secular. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in religion. So if you put those two things together, why wouldn't you think that you can conquer this disease? Surely we can defeat COVID, can't we? <laughs> we have science. I mean, science has made a lot of progress on, on this disease. Like, you know, the vaccines, the, the treatments, uh, treatment protocols are way better than they were two years, two and a half years ago. Um, science works... Is, it's an incredible thing for understanding the material world, but it takes its time. It requires debate and discussion. Uh, the problem isn't science so much, uh, Francis. The problem really is uh, we, we elevated some high scientific bureaucrats to the position of the high, of like a high pope. You got someone like Tony Fauci telling Rand Paul that, uh, you know, if you question me, you're not simply questioning a man, you are questioning science itself. I mean, come on, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. I mean, you just, you know, that's, that's, it's like the very antithesis of science that one person put, um, like, uh, puts on the mantle of, of, of essentially the, the, the high pope of science. Science is, requires people to like disagree with each other. I'm going to be wrong. I've been wrong lots of times in my life. And then what the, but the wrongness is, is adjudicated not by like some high pope or high priest. It's adjudicated by, you know, you, you run, you, you run a study, with some data and a, a fantastic study, and then it turns out that my theory was wrong. A, a, a beautiful theory killed by an ugly fact. That's the point <laughs> of the realm in science. Not not like Tony Fauci on high declaring this is the science. That's just nonsense. And that's what we've had through the pandemic. It's, it's, Martin Kulduff wrote about this as like the, the end of the age of enlightenment, it's the return of the dark age. The dark age, what that means is um, you, science uh, facts are determined by authority not by not by you know not not by data not by reason discussion not by discussion and debate 
Uh, and you, you've mentioned Anthony Fauci several times, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't followed the details of COVID, uh, particularly since in the UK it was kind of over, you might say. You know, the, the, certainly the public policy measures that I was so strongly against, they kind of stopped. And I think a lot of people felt the way I did, which is I just want to forget about this and never have to think about it again. I promptly then got COVID again, but never <laughs> mind. Um, uh, but anyway, I haven't had to... I haven't ha I haven't been forced to think about it in the way that I think I was before, where I was going, the government's going crazy. They're introducing all these measures that I, I think are tyrannical, frankly. I don't agree with them. Um, but you, you, uh, you and a lot of people uh, feel, I think, quite strongly about particularly Anthony Fauci and some of the actions that he took. So explain to us, why why are people so critical? What is the case against Anthony Fauci? Yeah, so first first of all, I was entirely jealous of Freedom Day. I was sitting here in the United States going, okay, how, how, on, how on earth you guys you guys get Freedom Day and we get we get vaccine mandates and nonsense. Um, mm, right. Uh, it could be worse, Joe. You could be in Canada. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um <laughs> I, I think uh, so the thing about Tony Fauci and and uh, and his boss Francis Collins, the reason why they're so important is because they sit on a top of forty five billion dollars, fifty billion dollars of money that funds every single biomedical uh, scientist of note in the United States and many in, in the UK as well, actually. Um, and, and the problem there is not that itself is not a problem. I mean, I, I fully support uh, public support of science. Um, but but the problem is that if that person or that set of people then involves themselves in controversial topics of health policy, a lot of scientists will keep themselves silent for fear of losing that support. And it's not just money, actually, because uh, many people don't know this. But like, if it, so, I have tenure at a medical school at, at, at a top medical school. The um, in order to get tenure, you actually have to you have to you have to get an NIH grant. You have to earn an NIH grant. It's very very competitive, and if you don't um, succeed at that, you're not going to get tenure. Social status in science depends on earning the approval of people like Tony Fauci and Francis Collins. And so when they uh, speak up and say, "Gosh, you know th this all this other uh, all these other ideas, the Great Barrington Declaration is nonsense." A lot of scientists are going to take the message, take the hint. You know, they don't. They they're not directly involved in health policy. They just won't speak up, even if they if they have uh, qualms about the policy. Um, and, uh, and some people will, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it, it, will someone rid me of the troublesome priest kind of thing? Like you're, you're, you'll get like people just, to, you know, ad hoc attacking because they want to curry favor. Um, um, it, it's, I think, uh, very, very dangerous to have this kind of power over the social status and funding of scientists and then also be so closely involved with health policy decision making in, in a country, which is exactly, I think, what why Tony Fauci's come under such criticism. And, and the problem is with this as well, possibly even more serious than that, Jay, is how much it damages the ordinary person's perception of scientists and doctors where they lose their trust in them which is a really dangerous place to be as a society. I, I completely agree. It's, and it's been shocking to watch. Uh, I've been, so I, you know, I, I do medicine. I, I've watched the anti-vax movement with, uh, with respect to measles and others before the pandemic. And I think it was mostly just, it really was a fringe movement. Um, mostly people trusted doctors when they told them that vaccines work for these diseases. During the pandemic, I've seen this vast explosion in the anti, this sort of the sentiment, I'm only going to call it anti-vax, this stemming from that distrust, Francis, of scientists and doctors created by this kind of hubris uh, by scientists and doctors. It's our own fault. Um, mm. And, and, and uh, it's so, uh, to me, it's completely understandable. Then on top of that, you have these vaccine mandates, which made it, you know, people that distrust, distrusted the, the vaccine now had to face this decision about whether they want, were willing to lose their jobs. Many did. Um, it's exploded, the distrust in vaccines generally. And the other thing is that the there was over-claiming about the efficacy of this vaccine. Um, and, you know, when scientists get things wrong, they, 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 they should have some distrust. <laughs> there should be some distrust. I think what would have gone a long way is just humility uh, by scientists, by doctors, Instead, and maybe it's less so in the UK, but in the United States, I mean, humility was probably the very last word I used to characterize the response of our of our public health officials. And it also seemed like 
the the government and the health authorities that they didn't really treat people like adults in the sense that mm. if like for example if you tell me that a vaccine is 100% safe it's safe i know you're lying no vaccine is 100% safe right they might be 99.99% safe but but it's not 100% safe and and anyone who claims otherwise is clearly lying or hiding something and likewise, people who pretend vaccines don't have side effects or that they have, a, you know, high levels of efficacy when clearly they don't. It seemed like I think a lot of the undermining that you're talking about happened because actually the authorities refused to be honest with us and treat us like adults. Would you agree? I completely agree. I mean, in fact, you can look at how they talk about about the, the, the vaccine uh, rollout, the, actually even the lockdowns. Um, actually, this in the UK, they actually had a group inside your your SAGE, which is the scientific organization that advises the government, um, called the Nudge Unit. The idea is to manipulate the the, the people of the UK. Um, they, the, the use of behavioral uh, psychology to try to manipulate people, essentially like a propaganda techniques. Um, and then overstating, just exactly like you said, Constantine, about, about basic things, right? So vaccines, it takes a while to, to, to understand the full safety profile. You test it on, what, 50,000, 100,000 people in the trials. Um, and then but that's then you send it out to billions. You're going to learn things about the, what the vaccine does, and it's not all going to be all good, right? So the, the, the myocarditis in young men from the mRNA vaccines, we didn't really know that from the trials. That came out afterwards. And it just takes time. I work on vaccine safety for a living, and it, you know, it takes decades sometimes to fully understand, certainly years, to promise that you're going to have no side effects? I mean, come on. That's just re- that's just treating p- people like they're, they're children. Um, and then like over-promising, right? We're, this vaccine is 100% effective against getting getting the disease. I got I was vaccinated. I got the disease. Like four months after I got the second vaccine, I got the disease. You can look at the data, the randomized trials, clear that they didn't even check for that. So what were they, what were they saying? Well, like, why were they over-claiming? They... A lot of the public health authorities viewed this as like, we have to convince, they were like essentially pharma salespeople. We have to convince people to get this. Uh, and in the back of their heads, they thought about this vaccine the same way they thought about the measles vaccine. You get the measles vaccine, you're pretty much not going to get measles ever again. You just, it's, it's a great vaccine. Um, I, I'm not saying it has absolutely no side effects, but it's pretty, pretty safe. Um, it, it, and whereas this vaccine, it just doesn't have that property. It doesn't stop you. It protects you against getting severe disease if you happen to uh, get COVID, which is very likely that you will. Um, but it doesn't stop you from getting COVID. Hey, Francis, do you like Japanese food? Of course. Who doesn't love a bit of sweet and sour pork, lemon chicken? Sweet and sour pork and lemon chicken aren't even Japanese. They're Chinese, Francis. But when I went to Japan, I had sweet and sour pork. Was it a Chinese restaurant in Japan? Yeah, I did wonder why it was called the Great Wall. (sighs) Unlike Francis, I've actually been to Japan. It is an amazing country which prides itself on combining traditional Japanese elegance with the latest in modern technology. And there is no better example of this approach than kamikata knives. The knives come in a heavy-duty ash wood box, which makes it a great present, especially with Christmas coming up. The knives are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world, so they're the perfect Christmas gift if you have a budding Gordon Ramsay in your kitchen. Kamikoto is running a massive early Black Friday sale right now and is offering our viewers an extra $50 off any purchase with discount code TRIGONOMETRY. Go to Kamikoto. Dot com slash trigonometry. As a trigonometry fan, you can get an incredible deal on a range of Kamikoto knife sets. Go to kamikoto.com slash trigonometry to get an extra $50 off on any purchase with this code trigonometry during the early Black Friday sale. I bet they're great for cooking lemon chicken. Cut! Do you worry, Jay, that when we have another pandemic, because we're going to have another pandemic, that's how, you know, such is life. That actually, such has been the distrust that, been, that has been sown within the wider population that you're going to get a pretty sizable majority of people are going to be like, nah, don't believe you. You betrayed my trust first time. Why am I going to believe you now? 
I mean, there there are still people in Wales that are really quite upset with Neil Ferguson, the the, the modeler, because of the the uh, the uh, um, mad cow disease. They killed they killed like a very vast number of, of of cows. Turns out it wasn't really necessary. Um, I, I think I, you're absolutely right, Francis. That's exactly what's going to happen. There's now a pretty broad movement, and I, I don't even know what the, what the name to call it, but it's 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 a movement that that had as its root deep distrust, a deep earned distrust of public health authorities and of governments acting in the name of public health. Um, I, I have to say, like, there will be, uh, if when there is another pandemic, there's going to be a big fight over whether we are, re-adopt this kind of authoritarian approach. I'm very afraid that exactly that's what will happen, that that the public health message is we just didn't, we didn't lock down hard enough. We didn't use our police power strongly enough. Um, and we need to absolutely demolish these 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 crazy fringe movements that are that are opposing us. I think that that kind of that's exactly the fight will happen in the next pandemic. Uh, should there be uh, dist- uh, authoritarian power applied in this in the name of public health even more than was applied now? That's the only reason it didn't work. Versus, let's go back to the old approach, which would have worked. Let's treat people in a in a in a, a democratic and liberal society as as adult human beings reason with them, use resources, move heaven and earth to protect vulnerable people. For God's sakes, yes. But also don't disrupt the lives of other people who are less vulnerable uh, in ways that harm them and society irreparably, almost. Yeah. Well, uh, Jay, you hinted earlier that you thought that one of the reasons that these approaches were never going to work in, in the West and particularly is the inequality, the unequal societies that we have. Can you talk to us more about that? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, we, it's not just the West is unequal. Every, everyone is unequal. I, 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 right. my, mm. my, 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 I, my mom was born in a Calcutta slum. My, my mom lived, born and grew up in a Calcutta slum, right? So it's, it's, um, it's so, uh, a lockdown. If you, if it's going to work in, in any, even in any theoretical sense, you have basically what the purpose is to is to keep people physically apart from each other, no, not, not anywhere in vicinity. If I'm physically apart from you, I can't spread the virus to you. Basic physics, right? The problem is. Most people are not in a economic situation that can abide a lockdown, um, or even a social situation that can abide a lockdown. It's not; it's it's inhumane, right? So you're we're we're actually built to be in community with each other, to talk to each other, to be social, to, to, and so that even even rich people have that need. Um, but poor people they need to work in order to feed their families. They need to work to they need to like they they need to be in society in order to have the most basic functions. Uh, many live in and poor countries live in crowded living situations. That's just a fact about the way the world is. Um, you can't have a lockdown. That lockdown will end up impoverishing people. That lockdown will end up throwing people into into food, di- di- you know, star- near starvation. That's actually what happened. A hundred million people is the estimate thrown into poverty worldwide by the economic dislocation caused by the lockdown. You know, those supply chains. Well, the pointy end of the supply chains is some guy in, in Ghana who's barely holding on, losing his job. And now he's making less than $2 a day of income. He can't feed his kids. Some of his kids starve. Um, there's one estimate from March of 2021 out of the UN that 230,000 children had died in South Asia alone from the lockdown, the economic dislocation caused, causing starvation in, by the lockdowns. Um, that and, and the and, and uh, the stopping of, uh, of of basic immunization. I mean, it's uh, it's it was bound to have that effect. It was bound to destroy the lives of the poor, the working class, the you know, it was, and it's, and and children. It's exactly what it did. Because in many ways, what it did is it favored big business. It favored you know these huge multinational corporations, and it also favored the laptop class. Because they were the ones insulated from it because they could still work. They could still do everything they needed to do. And in fact, they could save money because they didn't have to travel anywhere. You know, they could get discounts on their rent. But the working classes, they still had to go and do their job. You're, you're absolutely, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I've called it uh, trickle down epidemiology. The idea is that, <laughs> is, I mean, it's like if we just protect the laptop class, everyone else would be protected by osmosis or something. It, it you know, it worked, it worked exactly how you'd expect it to work. Um, I, I think um, a lot of the people that made these policies, they they moralized it, right? They're, they're, they are a class of people that could 
be protected by a lot. I look for me, I just, I, I, I'm a professor. I didn't have to, I could have worked from home the entire time would have been fine. Wouldn't have lost my job. I, I actually couldn't abide that. I, I went, I went to work, but, um, but a lot of the, a lot of this, a lot of the people that were in this, they've moralized it. Stay home, stay safe, right? You, you had that in the UK. What the heck is that message? That message is like, well, if I'm not able to stay home because I have to feed my family, I'm not, I'm not, I'm like endangering the community. That's, that's a terrible message to send to to the to a community to the vast numbers of people that actually couldn't stay home or stay safe just because of basic, uh, you know, basic economic reasons. Um, so I just I think. Um, it's 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 that deep inequality, and then this like valorization of of being rich enough or having the resources to be able to to comply with the orders, and then even there you still have like you know like Matt Hancock violating them, Boris Johnson violating them, like in, in where I live, uh, uh, Gavin Newsom having this French laundry dinner. Um, I mean, actually, frankly, I, whenever I saw that, I would celebrate not not because of the hypocrisy of it. <laughs> Although there was a little bit of that, I have to admit. Um, but 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 also because uh, you know people being human, it's fine. It's like I just it's just a reminder that everybody needs to be need needs connection. Jay, uh, let me explore you know the devil's advocate counter arguments here because uh, there are a lot of people who supported the lockdowns who would say, well, look, if we hadn't kept people physically apart from each other to some extent, obviously it wasn't a hundred percent, but if we hadn't reduced the number of people, the average person came into contact, the disease would have spread faster, it would have spread to more people, we didn't have a vaccine at the time, and the health care services, which were already struggling, I mean, the NHS, people don't know this, but uh, like there's newspaper headlines from every year over the last 20 years saying the NHS is about to collapse, winter crisis, the flu, blah, blah, blah. So you take that, you add on top of that this highly infectious disease that no one really knows, wasn't it the right decision based on all those inputs to go, let's keep people apart, let's reduce the spread, let's make sure our healthcare system is going to cope. You know, we built some hospitals, we didn't have the staff to put in them, but we built <laughs> the hospitals that, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I do, I do, I do constantly. So, so like the, the key thing is there is, um, and there's some force to that argument. So I don't think the right thing to do is to do nothing. I don't think the, the argument, the right argument is to let the virus rip. Because exactly what you said would happen would happen. Um, the the right thing to do is focus protection on the most high risk people that were likely to go to the hospital, right? So just uh, just to give you an example, in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo sent COVID infected patients to nursing homes, even though their older people were the highest risk of being hospitalized if they get COVID. Why did he do that? He was not because he's an evil guy. The reason he did that is because the epidemiologists were telling him. The, that you have to open hospital beds or people will die from, from overcrowded hospital beds. That was focused protection um, on the wrong population. If he had understood that older people were the most likely to be hospitalized, then he would never have done that. He would never have sent older people, uh, put the older people at highest risk. So if you want to protect hospital systems, you protect older people because that's who that's the highest risk. By by doing a focus protection approach, you you minimize the the risk of the the hospitals overcrowding. If instead you do a lockdown, the disease is going to spread anyways, right? You maybe maybe you delay for a short time, but not for that long. Like you know, like in Toronto, the, the it, during the earliest lockdowns, the the thirty richest neighborhoods saw no case spread. The thirty poorest neighborhoods had enormous outbreak. Um, that was re repeated everywhere you saw a lockdown. The, the lockdown was focus protection of the laptop class instead right. of focus protection of the of the of the vulnerable old and that's why hospital systems were under stress because we've protected the wrong people that now that that does make a lot of sense to mm -hmm. me uh, and uh coming to the conversation about the vaccine you you will know as as you alluded to that there are a lot of people who are who've got a lot of questions about it uh who are concerned about it what is your assessment of the safety and efficacy of the vaccines that we currently have at the moment? So uh, let me start with efficacy because that's, that's uh, I think, um, probably the most important thing. Um, I think, uh, uh, and, and and let me just start. I with, mean, I'd say safety is quite important. Well, well I mean, okay, but you're both you're they're both important. Actually, can I can I start with can I move to start with the conversation with uh, with yeah. immunity more generally because I think it's this is yeah. this is a key point that a lot of people when they talk about the vaccine they miss. Um, if you've had COVID and recovered. 
you actually have pretty substantial immunity, right? Before Omicron, something like 0.3% who had been infected. In, uh, there was a big study out of Italy, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, that had infected were reinfected, 0.3%, three out of 1,000. Yep, so it's very substantial immunity against reinfection until there's a new variant. And then the other thing is, if you have uh, infection and you recovered, you actually have pretty substantial immunity against uh, severe disease on reinfection. Um, there's a study out of uh, out of Israel suggesting that you know, there are ten times more, a t- ten times better protection than the vaccine. Now, I'm not saying I'm not arguing that you should should have gone out and gotten infected intentionally, but but the fact is, so many people have been infected and recovered. You know, I think in the United States it's above ninety percent of the population. Same in the UK. Um, so that changes the landscape about the efficacy of the vaccine. If you already, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, did you just did you say that over ninety percent of people have had COVID in the US and the UK? Yeah. Really? Yeah, based on oh wow, studies. I didn't know that. Okay, sorry. Uh, please carry on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it could be it, you could you could convince me eighty five percent. I mean, we can argue about the about the exact numbers, but like, yeah, you know, I just hadn't heard that. That's all. Please go ahead. Yeah. So what that means is that uh, that that uh, it's a very different population than than, than in March of twenty twenty, which was completely immune naive, and in that in that population that less than immune naive, the efficacy, the marginal efficacy of the vaccine against severe disease is is less important. Now there still may be populations that are for it's important. Again, focus protection, older people who've ne- not had the disease. That that are higher risk, um, you know, there still may be other other populations. Um, so I'm not saying don't it has no use, but it's it's much more limited than it was in December of 2020 when the vaccine first arrived. Um, the vaccine itself, um, the it's because you know, it's, it was designed for the the old the you know the, the Wuhan strain originally. Now we have these bivalent boosters boosters that are designed for a strain that actually are, is mostly out, <laughs> on its way out. Um, so uh, we have a. It's we're sort of chasing our tail with with uh, with like exactly the the formulation of the vaccine. But all that is actually much less important than the fact of the vaccine. The vaccine itself, if you're immune naive, does protect you against severe disease and death. Uh, now, what is that risk? It's it's very high for the old. Maybe I just the, the rule of thumb I had before before uh, before Omicron was every uh, let's say you're 50 years old, 0.2 percent mortality. From the disease, just the rule of thumb, um, and every seven years of age it doubles. So I was I was fifty four. It'll be point three ish. Um, you know, if you're fifty seven, it'll be point four. If you're sixty four, it'll be point eight. And you go back down the other way. By the time you're you, you know you're you're both young men, it's going to be pretty low. The mortality risk from the disease. Um, the uh, the vac- the vaccine then is much more important for older people who face a very high risk. If you're over 80, it's got a very high risk of dying, uh, three, four, five percent. So it reduces it by tenfold. Really useful. Doesn't stop you from getting it. So it's efficacious in one way, but less efficacious in another. The the degree of efficacy, uh, the extent of it matters. It depends on who you are. Old, younger people less so, older people more so. Now the vaccine side effects. The, the for young men, the the mRNA vaccines cause myocarditis at unacceptable rates. One in two thousand, one in three thousand, something like that. That is too high. It does, and some, sometimes people will say, "Well, gosh, it protects you against getting COVID, which can also cause myocarditis," which is true. Um, that it also causes myocarditis, but it doesn't protect you against getting COVID. So now you face both risks: you face the risk of the vaccine myocarditis, and you face the risk of COVID myocarditis. Um, so, you know, for young men, it's and you don't get a huge benefit because you already are protected from COVID by dint of being young. Um, so, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't understand the push to vaccinate children, for instance, because um, the, the cost benefit just doesn't work out. It's one thing if you have a vaccine, you have to vaccinate children in order to have the disease stop spreading. But this vaccine doesn't do that. So what's the argument? <laughs> and Jay, I suppose the one thing that whenever I hear people talk, they always ignore long COVID. They always ignore the people who get COVID and then become desperately ill as a result of that. So can you enlighten us? What are the portion of people who get COVID who were previously healthy, active, fit adults, and then because for a variety of different reasons are no longer able to work or their their life is no longer what it used to be? Yeah, no, I, so that's a really good question, uh, Francis, and thank you for asking it. So so the key, the key thing is um, 
uh, in terms of the policy, preventing long COVID means preventing you from getting COVID. Mm. I don't know any technology that does that. So what we're talking about is, is, is then is just how do we support the people who have this out long-term outcome? Um, now, in terms of like who gets these long-term outcomes, uh, in my view, there's three different categories of people. I don't, I can't give you precise numbers because people are still debating about the, about this. Um, but, but like the three categories are people who had a very severe acute bout with COVID. They ended up in the hospital, in the ICU. If you end up in the ICU, you're going to have a long time recovering. That's just the nature of the thing. Um, and, uh, that's, it's going to be hard. There's no, there's no, there's no sugar coating. What's best is don't end up in the ICU. How do you do that? Reduce the risk of, of, of exposing older people to COVID before the vaccine, vaccinate older people now that we have the vaccine. Um, second group are people who um, uh, have these like lingering symptoms, right? The, probably the classic one is uh, you can't smell. Uh, Omicron doesn't seem to produce that at the same rate, but like there's some people, uh, so I when I got COVID, I, I lost my sense of smell and it, it came back about three weeks later. I was I was, I was absolutely thrilled when I could smell, you know, <laughs> I, could, I could smell mustard again. That was, that was, that was fun. Um, um, but uh, uh, some people, there are maybe one, 1%, less than 1%, um, can't, a year later can't smell, right? Uh, the, there's some lingering effects like brain fog, things like that. Brain fog meaning like people can't, people are fatigued and they, they have trouble having trouble like, you know, with, with like regular activities in life. Um, people have done studies of this where uh, you, in order to do the, to quantify the number to answer your question, you can't just look at people who've had COVID and then ask them. You have to have a control group of people who've never had COVID because so, many of those symptoms are nonspecific, right? I'm often tired and, you know, I'll, you can call it what I have is brain fog. Maybe I brain fog. No, you guys, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, but that uh, that so you have to have that control group. And studies that have the control group, they find in children, basically no difference between the set of kids who had COVID versus who didn't. Three months later, having one of these like non-specific symptoms, um, maybe it's like five percent report at least one of the symptoms. Um, in big studies, like in out of France and elsewhere, uh, in in adults you see higher rates in people who've had COVID versus the, the control group, but it's like 7% versus 4%. Um, and it varies. So I think there's 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 some legitimate lingering symptoms for COVID in a relatively small group of people. Um, there's also a third group that, um, I mean, I think we've been through a tremendously stressful time. And it's been, it, you know, people have been gripped in fear over this, over the, not so, not hopefully not so much anymore, but over, over the risk of getting this disease. And it, I think that there's a somatization of the symptoms um, that comes from that. That's why you see people who have not had COVID, uh, you know, in 2020 saying like they felt like they had long COVID. It's a lot of that comes out of depression, fear, anxiety, um, and those are those are those are real things. I don't want to diminish them. And those are things, but you have to treat that very differently than you treat. You know, I can't smell a year later after I got COVID. Um, so it's it's uh, so I think it's the, it's a combination of those three things. It may be in countries that have had these lockdown policies where that fear you're going to because of group three you're going to have a much larger fraction of it, right? So you don't hear about long COVID in Africa, even though COVID spread all through Africa. Um, uh, so. Uh, the, the, I mean, I think we we have to treat it seriously. We have to think about it about about how to manage all of, of all three of those groups seriously. Um, but you can't come to the conclusion that because there's long COVID, therefore we should do lockdown. The lockdown didn't work to stop COVID. Why would you think it would work to stop long COVID? Hey Francis, do you like locals? I live in London, mate. So obviously not. The only pleasure I get from the locals is when we share an intimate moment as we watch a Japanese tourist get trapped in a tube door. That is good. But I wasn't talking about the locals, I was talking about our community on Locals. You mean the one where you get phenomenal behind the scenes content when you like your space with fish fish fish. When you get to ask incredible guests like Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, Bill Burr, Sam Harris, Adam Carolla, Heather Hying, 
and others your questions? Not just that, you can get supporter-only benefits like trigonometry mugs, monthly calls with our other top supporters, and even a regular meal with me and Francis. You also get phenomenal behind-the-scenes footage of our trip to America where we met a whole host of incredible guests and gave ourselves terminal indigestion. We're also starting to do monthly giveaways for locals only. The first one will be signed copies of Andrew Doyle's new book. Plus, you get access to an incredible community of like-minded people who share memes, have fun conversations, and most importantly, you get to make new friends. You can support us with as little as $7 or about five pounds a month, or give us more for the higher tier benefits. Go to Trigonometry .locals.com. Go to trigonometry.locals.com and support the show. One of the things that I found very interesting about the illness is how it affected certain groups. So, for instance, my, my mother's Latin American. And in South America, it, it really affected the population. A lot of people died. Uh, it caused chaos. Whereas if you look at Africa, it was nowhere near as bad. And you, and you look at you go, well... Obviously, there's difference between groups of people and et cetera, but they're both third world countries, you know, and so on and so forth. So do, do we know the reasons why it affected certain groups and not others as, as badly? I think we're still learning about that. So like Africa, I think the probably the most important fact is I think something like 3% are over the age of 65. That's why it didn't really have, it spread everywhere. You can't lock down, but it, it didn't really affect um, most of the population because most of the population is young you know, a very large frac fraction under the age of 18, excuse me. Uh, Latin America is older, um, for one. So I think that's probably the primary reason. The other thing is like Latin America, like I, was, I was looking at the lockdown in Peru and my heart just broke. Like they they, 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 they were a massive poor population of poor folks in Peru who were just devastated by the lockdowns. And then uh, at one point, they, uh, they reclassified all their deaths, the excess deaths as COVID deaths. And so you're like, oh, all well, you had the lockdown, and then you reclass, and you had all these COVID deaths anyways because of the reclassification. In fact, they were just lockdown deaths, um, deaths because they had this draconian policy that didn't let poor people, you know, go earn a living so that they could feed their families. And Jay, well, I want to ask you a slightly provocative question um, because, as you know very well, I'm sure uh, a lot of because so much of public health policy was so difficult to understand for people who were attempting to think rationally, who were not experts. I was trying to look at it and go, well, why on earth would you do this? This clearly doesn't make any sense. Why on earth would you do? Why would you force people to take a vaccine that doesn't stop the spread? Like all of this stuff. And it has produced, as you alluded to earlier, a lot of people who think there's something deeply nefarious going on here. These aren't mistaken people who were trying to, you know, do their best and maybe cover up for the fact that it leaked from a lab in Wuhan and whatever. But actually, this is an attempt by the public health establishment to take more control of people's lives, you know, permanent surveillance, telling you, you know, you, you can't buy a train ticket if you haven't been vaccinated. And, you know, we see some news stories out of places like Canada where they do seem to sort of be heading in that direction. I read a, a, a story today about how I think somebody in Canada is recommending that unvaccinated people are treated as mental health problems that to be solved. W what do you make of all of that? What, what do you say to those people? Do you agree with them? Do you have an explanation of why they're wrong? Like, what, what's your take on all of it? I mean, I think it's it's complicated. Like, there are there are definitely people, Constantine, who, who took advantage of the pandemic and put, took advantage. Mm -hmm. Like, there and uh, they absolutely did. So, like, you know, the pharmaceutical companies pushed. There's a drug called Remdesivir put out by Gilead. They the, the, they was pushed really hard on the basis of really bad evidence. And a lot of patients got it in hospital. The, the, the claims is the claim is that it, it may actually harm people. I, I don't know if that's true, but like it's 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 um it certainly didn't help people. It didn't solve didn't solve you from uh, from dying in hospital if you took it. Um, so I think uh, I think that uh, there are pharma interests that took advantage. There were politicians that took advantage. Um, there were a very large number of of public health. Uh, people it, it especially i mean it looks like anyone with an mph on twitter you know, like they're just they <laughs> they have this like this thing like they, they convey this anxiety don't 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 see your family at christmas don't don't uh 
don't hug your children. Don't uh, if you if they, if your kids coming from home from college, put stick them in the garage. Don't 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 let them anywhere near you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you you get this sense like the that the, the the whole profession of public health is filled with these anxiety ridden people who don't know how to manage mm-hmm. risk. Um, so I, I think uh, there's some aspect of of people people's uh, foibles and and, uh, and and economic interests did play a big role in in this, but I don't think it was the center of it. I think it was these opportunities presented themselves, and and, and people did what they normally do: is they take it, they 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 act in their own interest, um, not for any nefarious reasons, because that this it just is their own interest. I I place the central blame in public health authority, the top public health authorities who argued that we had to follow this policy or else. And all of the dominoes that came out of that are, after that are just, are, are like, they, it, it, it came out of that, that first domino being pushed. And Jay, talk to me about something else, because one of the most difficult issues kind of intellectually for me to, to think about during this whole thing is, I felt viscerally that vaccine mandates, the government saying you must inject this thing in your body. We know, we knew at the time it had side effects. We knew that it would have side effects because all medicine does. Uh, I thought that that was wrong. And I can't, I'm not a trained doctor or public health official or anything like that. I just thought that that was a line the government shouldn't cross in these kind of situations. What are the ethics of mandatory vaccinations uh, from your perspective as someone who understands health and understands public health? Should it ever happen? I mean, if it, look, somebody said to me in the, the podcast I did, what if this had like a 90% mortality rate? Now, my facetious counter argument is if it did, everybody would take the bloody vaccine by themselves. That's right? not facetious. You're absolutely right. 100%. However, you know, what are the ethics? Is is it as simple as what I'm saying? The government should never do that or are there circumstances where they should? H- how do we make these decisions as a society? Okay, so first, uh, let me, like for vaccine mandates, if you are mandating the vaccine, you have failed as a public health agency. Because what, what, the, it, that, what that means is there's a substantial number of people who don't trust you. They don't trust you, right? And, and so like, as a general rule, you don't want to tell people to take something that's bad for them on net, right? So the the only reason why you would ever want to do a mandate is there's a group of the part of the population who essentially has to take one for the team, right? You're going to expose them to something that's bad for them because then it'll benefit the community at large. Otherwise, there's no purpose in it. What you said is exactly right. So if, if there's a 90% death rate from some disease and there's a vaccine that gets rid of the, that risk, everyone will take it with no mandate. Uh, if, 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 as long as the public health agency is trustworthy enough that you you can be, you believe them, right? Um, so I think, um, so the first observation, if you're requiring a vaccine mandate, the public health agency has failed. It doesn't. It, it it doesn't have the trust it needs from the population, so that you it, we, when you tell you when when, when I tell you uh, uh, you know Francis this this, this vaccine is good for you, um, you believe me and take it. Um, so the, the, like you know Sweden didn't vac- had no vaccine mandate and yet incredible uptake of the of the of the of the vaccine because people trust the Swedish public health agency. Um, okay, second thing, um, I I, th- I think. There's a legitimate social debate to be had about whether uh, whether if you have a vaccine that stops disease transmission and you have a group of people who don't want to take it because it's bad for them, whether it's it's ethical to force them to take it. I've, yeah. I've seen good arguments both ways. Uh, and I, frankly, I, I, I'm undecided about that. I think it would matter a lot about exactly the nature of the disease and how it spreads. And it would be, it would be a complicated, difficult argument to have, right? Um, so... Kids, I don't think, are very high risk from COVID. I don't. I think the vaccine is is, is not worthwhile to give to children. Um, but you could convince me that if kids are super spreaders and the vaccine stopped the disease spread, maybe we can we can have an argument. I probably would come down the other way because I don't think we should ask kids to bear, bear the burden of of, of of the disease spread. But like that, that's a, that's that's you know, people could differ on that. Mm-hmm. But we don't have a vaccine like that. We don't have a vaccine that stops disease spread. So why did we create this like second class citizenship for vac- for unvaccinated people? Like these pariahs. It's, it's, it's essentially it's like, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a vaccine discrimination. 
right? Like in Canada, you couldn't travel internally. You still can't come to the United States if you're just visiting, um, if you're unvaccinated. What, what purpose is served by that? COVID's everywhere. An unvaccinated person is not unclean. That's essentially what, like treating them as lepers. I, I have no idea, and there's no justification for it. It just, all it serves to do at this point is undermine trust in public health. Jay, uh, this is uh, this is actually true, and it's something that always used to make me laugh. Apparently, Hitler was against vaccine mandates because he thought it was a bit far. <laughs> <laughs> he was a vegan too, or something. I don't. Or yeah. yeah. But I, I think an important question that we should ask at this point in the interview, Jay, is what have been the long term health effects of the lockdown? Mm. Because I'm seeing an excess death rate. We've got an excess death rate in this country. Nobody's really talking about it because... It's it, long COVID, mate, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's an unpleasant truth that really nobody wants to talk mm. about. So wh what is, have, have actually been the effects of these lockdowns? I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking, right? So um, uh, in, in Europe, there was a modeling study, it was a really interesting model study, that suggests that 100 million people had skipped cancer screening during the pandemic. And 100 yet, million. 100 million cancer screenings had been, I, I shouldn't say people, 100 million cancer screenings had been skipped. Um, and uh, that's going to lead to a million people with can later stage cancer that should have been picked up, then that, 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 that they're going to, you know, often will kill them that shouldn't have killed them. The so women will die of breast cancer, stage two, uh, stage three, stage four, that should have been picked up at stage one um, from renal screening that didn't happen. Um, th that's, I mean, that's just one, one thing. Uh, the, the, the psychological effects in the U.S., something like one in four young adults seriously considered suicide in June of 2020. The overhang for like anxiety and depression is enormous. I think that's uh, the, maybe, maybe it's a little less true in Europe and the U.K. because you guys had Freedom Day earlier. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, in, 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 it, we, there are like measles cases now, outbreaks in the United States because people skipped basic immunization. Um, polio has come back. It was on its way out. We were like this close to eradicating polio. Um, in poor countries, it's even worse, right? In, um, I, th I think Uganda, uh, the estimate is that four and a half million kids after two years of Zoom school, which is, which is ridiculous in a, in, in a country like Uganda, um, you, 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 they, they never came back to school. That means it's a generation of, of poor kids in Uganda who will never get an education and will grow up, grow up poor. We've just like, we've, we've fueled inequality in a way that like, it's, it's almost unimaginable. Um, and they will, they will lead shorter lives. Even, it turns out like even in rich countries, um, short interruptions of school has these like long-term negative consequences on the lives of, of kids because, you know, they grow up poorer. One estimate published in JAMA Pediatrics early in the pandemic, was that just the spring closures alone have led will lead to five and a half million lost life years for American kids. Um, the, the overhang of these lockdowns in terms of what, the, what they've done to our health of our society, the social inequality, the, the, the poverty, is almost, it's almost impossible to exaggerate. It is, it is catastrophic and terrible. I don't know for certain all those excess deaths you talked about, Francis, are due to the, to the lockdowns, but I, I do believe a substantial fraction must be um, the, the long tail of the lockdown harms. Places that, And do you think... Oh, sorry, carry on, Joe. No, I just, just a one, one more data point. Uh, the, uh, the, the lock... The, the, uh, in Scandinavia, the uh, all-cause excess death rates are actually quite low now, um, you know, close to zero. I mean they didn't lock down nearly as, 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 as much as the UK did or the U or the U S did. I think that that's, I think that the lockdowns will ultimately play some role in, in explaining it. Joe, do you think we've learned our lessons from these mistakes or do you, or do you think we're going to just going to make the same mistakes again? We have not learned our lessons, Francis. Um, I, I do have some hope that we might, uh, the UK, there's a, I think a parliamentary inquiry that's happening on, on COVID and there's still now some fight over exactly what's going to be part of that. Um, I think any honest evaluation of these policies will conclude that they were a failure. And um, th they were a disastrous failure that has harmed the, the economic well-being, the physical well-being, the psychological well-being of vast populations. Any 
inquiry like the parliamentary inquiry that's happening in the UK that doesn't conclude that lockdowns were a disaster, I think or, or won't have been an honest evaluation. There's a lot of people who made these decisions that have a strong vested interest in making sure that these inquiries end up saying, oh, everything was fine. We, we, we did the best we could under, under uh, uh, circumstances where it was difficult. But it, that's not actually right. They suppressed voices that opposed it. Um, they, 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 they engaged unethical behaviors like stoking fear in the population using behavioral economics techniques to do that. Um, they, they made tremendously bad decisions by cl closing themselves off from criticism. They employed censorship in social media and a whole bunch of other settings so that people couldn't effectively push back. Um, so I, I think um, the ultimate outcome of this needs to be these discussions it needs to involve people who were who were pushed aside in the debate. Uh, and I think the ultimate out outcome has to be that lockdown has to be a dirty word. We have to look whenever we think about the word lockdown, whenever we think about the concept of lockdown, we shudder in, in, in fear. We say we should never do this again. Um, that has to be the outcome of these, but I'm very afraid that that's not going to be. The vested interests that pushed these these policies, um, that benefit from these policies, don't want it to be concluded that way, because they, then, my God, like it's a world historic bad thing that happened that they did. Um, mm. um, now, I think the outcome should also involve some level of forgiveness. I mean, it, you know, like this was so big a thing. It's like uh, you know, you 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 don't. We have to come together. We can't like put half the, you know, uh, indict half the people in the world that made these decisions or very very high. They, they, we have to live with them. So there has to be some some kind of forgiveness, but not until we have a solid understanding and acceptance that we, what we did was deeply wrong. And Jay, this is perhaps a strange question to ask, but um, Francis and I were both vocal about some of what we th thought was happening going too far uh, and a lot of other people were but do you think do you think we as the general public i know you you and and your colleagues were very courageous in actually attempting to to speak up at a time when it was difficult and you you were demonized and not allowed to speak on these big tech platforms as we 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 had our issues with that as well but do you think we as the public did enough to stand up to this did we do everything that we could or do you think that you know, it seemed to me like there were a lot of people who actually would have agreed with us, but just preferred to be quiet because that, that was the direction that the government was going. I mean, I think in March of 2020, it was basically impossible. I think that, that the that the fear was so great that it was very hard to, for, if the public were, I mean, I remember there was someone, some group tried to organize a lockdown protest in, in, in local and they were just, I mean, <laughs> normally protests in, in like, you know, hippie dippy California are fine, but you can't, you just can't do that. Um, in March of 2020, I, but I and I, and I but I think a lot of the, uh, the I, I mean, like the, the easy answer, Constantine, is that we, the public didn't do enough. But I don't blame the public, right? You had deployed against the public these techniques of social control that are very difficult to to, to push back against, right? Uh, if if you're you know, you're censored on YouTube or whatever, well now people like distrust me because gosh, the, these smart people in, in tech think I'm saying something crazy enough that they can't even be presented to the public at all. Um, it, you, 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 you organize a protest or something against the lockdown. And then, um, all these pub, these, these very smart people say you're doing something deeply irresponsible. Um, it's very difficult for the public without to, 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 to speak up. And in fact, one of the reasons we wrote the great Barrington declaration was to enable the public to say, look, there isn't a, consensus on on the lockdown there are legitimate people who disagree with it and so they could speak up and say well you know we're not crazy we're we're we're, we're actually um engaging in the public fight over over this deeply important issue and we should have our voice heard that was that was one of the purposes was to like enable that to happen so that because uh, before that it's like oh yeah all the entire scientific clarity agrees <laughs> that the that the lockdowns are the way if you speak up you're insane um, so I, th I think, um, I think that it, it's, it's the answer to your question is yes. I think the public, um, sh should have spoken up more, but at, at the same time, I don't see how they could have spoken up given the, the social pressures that were put in place to make sure that they stayed silent. That makes sense. Well, look, we're coming to the end of the interview, so we'll ask you our usual final question, but I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to very succinctly 
tell everybody what we should do next time? Let's say we have another pandemic mm. that's exactly like COVID, but not COVID. What do we do? The, the key principle is focus protection. Identify high-risk people, move heaven and earth to protect them. And may, it might be a different set of high-risk people. Maybe it won't be elderly next time. Maybe it'll be kids. Um, so you'll have to be very creative about how to do that. It's going to require a local effort. It's not going to be one global policy. The living circumstances in London will be different than in L.A., than in Billings, Montana. Um, but it's going to require creativity, focus protection of high-risk people, and then then like develop uh, vaccines, develop treatments as rapidly as you can. That's the right way to deal with it. Never lock down again. Do not disrupt the lives of people that keep society going, assuming that everyone is capable of, of, of the, 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 the kinds of, 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 uh, uh, of activities that the, uh, that the laptop class made. That, that, that we have to understand that, uh, that society real, really is unequal. And don't trust just epidemiologists. Let, let's have other people at the table. Let's have, let's have like, uh, you know, it shouldn't just be scientists. These are two complicated decisions that involve values that scientists apparently are incapable of seeing. Jake, before, there's one last question I wanted to ask because there is now an Ebola outbreak happening in Africa at the moment, which I'm sure you're, you're probably well aware of. Do you, does it worry you that as a, as a disease, that kind of pandemic where you've got, a disease that is so deadly like Ebola, does that have a, a chance of becoming a global pandemic? I think it's unlikely. Um, uh, Ebola is, is a deadly disease, but it, you get symptoms fairly quickly and it's, you're very sick. And so you're not going to go around spreading it. Uh, it spreads in conditions where it, it's poor, where people are living in close, close contact with people, unavoidable contact. Um, I don't think it spreads the way that this disease spreads. This is the reason why this disease was so highly transmissible is because it's aerosolized. It lives in the air. You, you breathe it. It's, it. That's why masks don't work so well is because you have these gaps. You have glasses fog up. That's aerosolized aerosolization events. If you have if you have COVID, it's, it's COVID on your glasses. <laughs> um, you know the. Uh, so so uh, yeah, I'm not so worried about that. I, I am worried that 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 the Ebola get managed well in Africa. You don't want people to die there of that disease. But I think that there, we actually have pretty good tools to try to re reduce the spread of that disease in Africa. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried there's gonna be, be a global pandemic. I do think we have to take it seriously there. Well, Jay, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, and this can be completely unrelated, by the way, to COVID and everything we've talked about. But uh, as always, what do you think is the one thing that we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? <laughs> uh, there's an irony in this. I think censorship kills, Constantine. I think censorship is the worst. And uh, maybe we're starting, maybe that's not the right answer to your question because we are talking about it. It's funny that we're, we're, we're talking about censorship, um, um, but we're not talking about it enough. Um, and I, I, I am really glad to see Elon Musk trying to, trying to uh, bring back some voices that were silenced. Um, but that needs to be a society-wide effort. I, I thought we had a norm in, about this in Western Western democracies that we we didn't we didn't silence each other. We might yell at each other, but we don't silence <laughs> each other. Um, let's bring that norm back, and we're not talking enough about that. I agree completely. Well, we're going to ask you a couple of questions from our local supporters that only they will get to see on the locals. But Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys for watching and listening. We will see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or our show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. I do worry about the side effects of the vaccines for, for young men, uh, for, for sure. 